Thank you. Well, good morning. It's the 29th September 2024. Uh, we're in the house of God and we're looking at the Holy Scriptures. We're looking at John chapter 9. If you're in the Church Bible, that's page 1077. Let's, can we pray? Lord, we uh, thank you for your Holy Word, your Word which is eternal and uh, is as the heavens and above the heavens. You said, Lord, that the heavens and the earth will pass away, but your words are forever, and we are saved by faith in what you have said. We do not want to hear from man today, we want to hear from you. So look at your holy word, please enlighten us, instruct us, encourage us, correct us, feed us, lead us on into truth. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now the title of my talk is Truth and Experience, short title, Truth and Experience. And I'm reading, to start, I've got a few scriptures, but verses 24 and 25 of John 9. Then they called the man that was blind. Now this man was born blind, a baby born blind. What a tragedy. And Jesus has healed him, and he now can see. And they call the man and they say, Give God the praise. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. They didn't know much, did they? He answered and said, Well, whether he's a sinner or not, I, I don't know. One thing I know, whereas I was blind, and now I see. The power of experience the power of testifying, speaking forth what God has done. I saw a fantastic clip last night, I wasn't, just came up, of a South African Satanist, and didn't he look like one? And uh, he's interviewed first of all, and he says, well, there's 12,000 of us. And then there's another interview, and he's in tears. He says, something appeared to me. I thought it was a demon or I was hallucinating. And he said, it's Jesus. He said, I didn't believe in Christ. I've, actually, I believe more scientifically. I've been an atheist. And he said, I'm scared. And he said, I felt a flood of love pour into my soul. A flood of love. And he said, I've been looking for this all my life. And the Lord said, but you haven't opened yourself to this. And now he's a thoroughly saved Christian. And he's telling people, telling people. And there's something about telling forth, isn't there? If you confess with your mouth the Lordship of Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I'm quoting, obviously, from Romans uh, 10. The power of testimony. And, uh, and you see in this passage, in this occasion, the terrific difference where religion without Christ leads you to, as opposed to where an encounter with Jesus takes you. I mean, the difference well, it can't be measured. It couldn't be more different, could it? Religion without Christ. Knowing many things that are true, but not knowing God. And, that, and I'm going to come to that and how awful that is in a while. Now, they are so um, narrow. If you go back to verse 16, then said some of the Pharisees, these learned teachers of the law, who should have been guiding the people into truth, this man is not of God. That's their verdict on Christ. He's not of God. Why? Well, he did this on the Sabbath. Others, a bit more discerning, said, well, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there's a division among them. You know, division is a very good thing. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace on the earth. I've come to bring a sword. From now on, in every house... There'll be two against three, three against two, mother against a uh, mother against a daughter-in-law, and, and so on, because 
when truth is pronounced, you've got to make a choice. You, once truth really comes, you're, from there on, you're going to be on one side or the other. That's, that's just inevitable. Part of what the gospel will always do, it shines a brilliant light that you love or hate, actually, in the end. Now, I'm not, God knows, I'm not discounting the importance of truth and their learning and they, what they had learned was of God. Moses and the prophets and all of that was all of God. And they knew it too. And you think when you get to the Apostle Paul, before he is Paul and he's Saul, the Pharisee, he knew the scriptures more than anybody. He'd been at the best college under Gamaliel and he did it to the best of his ability. And he chose the toughest, most disciplined religious life that he could. But he didn't know God. In fact, the opposite is like these people. He is persecuting God's children until he meets with Jesus Christ. And this is the key to everything, friends. It's not what you know, not what you've studied, even if all of that is true. It is a meeting with Jesus Christ in the which your blind eyes are opened, which is what happens to happen to this man. And it's a picture, that a literal blindness and a literal recovering of sight, but it's a metaphor, it's a picture, isn't it, of what we all need to meet with Christ and have our spiritual eyes opened. Now, I, but I am not discounting the importance of God's word. Of course I'm not. I, I'm just going to go to John... 18, uh, we looked at this a few weeks ago, but I'm in uh, page 1089, and when Jesus is on trial before Pilate, the Roman governor, and uh, they, they, they say in verse 36, my king, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, my servants would fight. We would do what worldly people do. We'd fight to get what we want. We'd back our leader with violence if my kingdom was of this world. Um, and, and then Pilate said, verse 37, Pilate said to him, are you a king then? Jesus said, you say I'm a king. To this end was I born. This is the Son of God giving an account of the reason for his birth on this, in this world. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. So what a statement Jesus makes in regard to the importance of truth. Vital. It's the reason I came to this world, says the Son of God. Truth. And I can remember, um, and I'm, sorry, before I leave, go to that, my own experience, let's go back to another page to John 17, where again the importance of truth is illustrated and this is the prayer at the end of the last supper this is Jesus prayer and um, I'm going to look at the first few verses in a minute but uh, he says this he's, he is now he is now praying for his people and I love the way that prayer is extended over the centuries to us today um, Verse 20, neither do I pray, pray for these alone, but for them which you will believe on me through their word. We are believers on Christ because we have heard the word which his servants gave to us. It's in the Bible. Everyone written by one of God's servants, we have believed, and we come into the wonderful ambit of that prayer. But he says this, verse 17, well, 16, they're not of this world even as I'm not of the world. It's good to be otherworldly, isn't it? And it's an amazing fact, and it's quite a sense, and I bet you all, if you know Jesus, you sense it at times the way I do. You know, you're walking down the road. You say, I'm not one of these people. I hope there's a lot of others somewhere, and around me maybe there are, but I'm not of these people. I don't belong here. I belong to that world that is to come. I belong to that world that you cannot see with natural eyes. That world that is revealed by Jesus Christ. That world which is the real world, actually, and it's more real than this thing, this planet we're standing on. This will be wrapped up and put away. 
the real world. We are of that world. And it says, you know, in, in Hebrews 11, where you get that marvellous list of the men and women of faith. And it says of Abraham, he looked, he looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. That is our city, friends, isn't it? Jerusalem, which is above, which is the mother of us all. But I was so moved, um, I mean, a few years ago now, I'm in the late, late 20s, and by a sermon, actually. I'd, all, I'd been studying the Bible, because I'd really come to God in my early 20s, but I'd been studying the Bible. But I heard a sermon by that lovely brother, David Powell, who gone to be with Jesus now, but, and um, he based it on, I don't want to go there, but on, I've mentioned it enough times, but on 2 Corinthians 11, where uh, he is talking to this great church at Corinth, and, and what a mighty church it was, the visitation they'd had from God's servants, from the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, all in operation, and the mighty men and teachers they'd had. And yet he says to them, and it's so alarming, at the end of his second letter, that I'm anxious about you. I want you to be a chaste virgin, ready for your bridegroom. As a church, it's a picture, isn't it, of marriage. Christ and his wife, the church. But I'm afraid, in case, just in the same way that the devil got round Eve in the garden, he may get round you. And it's a, it's a, I think it's verse 4, when he says, if somebody comes with a different Jesus, different, go uh, different gospel, different spirit, you might well bear with them. Instead of that instinctive, immediate reaction, this isn't of God, go away, they might begin to seduce you. And the point that he made in his sermon is this, that truth is everything. Anything else can deceive you. Good men, books, the internet, your own heart can deceive you, but what will never deceive you is truth. And I took that on board in my late 20s. And I thought, right, I'm going to read this book till it's in my soul. And I recommend you, friends, take the same line. Because that will keep you from all the clever deceptions. And they are clever. And there's such a war against truth. Since the church began, well, since the human race began, if you like, in the Garden of Eden. A war against truth. What does the devil say to Eve? Has God said that? Is that really true? You don't need to really believe that. You can eat that apple, you won't die. Actually, you're going to gain a terrific spiritual increase in perception. Well, they did, in a sense. They suddenly found out what was sin and what wasn't sin, and but what did they pay for it? Death. Death. And so there's always been a battle against truth, and truth is incredibly important. But, if you know all about God but don't know God... It's worse than knowing nothing, friends. I, I really say that. It is worse than knowing nothing, spiritually. And, um, you know, everything is so importantly based that matters on what God has said. What has God said? So what's the issue that we're looking at now? Um, what do you think? And what do you think? And what does she think? No. What has God said? Let's find out what the Bible says. That's going to be the answer, and that can't be wrong. And uh, I want to give some... Uh, I mean, and can I say, there are no worse creatures than religious people, even in office, but don't know God. And I'm, going to, I'm going to give you two illustrations from Scripture. I'm going to go back to um, uh, 1 Samuel 2. This is Eli the priest, and Eli is the priest... He's of the line of Aaron, appointed by God. No doubt about it, he was properly in office, that man. And uh, far more astonishingly and devastatingly, so were his wicked sons, Phineas and Hophni. And I'm in, um, sorry, on page um, 306, 1 Samuel 2, now we're verse 12. Um, now the sons of Eli, and my point here is about how the worst kind of person is someone who knows, maybe is in office, but doesn't know God. And we'll see that here. 
Verse 12, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial, children of the devil. They knew not the Lord. They knew not the Lord. But they're the priests. And I'm reading on, look at them. Verse 22, now Eli was very old and he heard all that his sons did to Israel, how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Can you imagine? These girls have come up to serve God. They need the priests to guide and help them. What are the priests doing? Well, seducing them. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? I hear your evil doings by all this people. Everybody's talking about you. And then he makes this point, friends, and let it sink in. My sons, it's no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. And you know, the effect of that wicked leadership even if it's appointed, turns people against God. And then he says this, if one man sin against another, the judge should judge him. You know, there'd be an answer in the courts. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? For him? Notwithstanding, they listen not to the voice of their father. They didn't listen to their father. He's telling them exactly what is right. And he's warning them that what you're doing is against God. You are in big trouble. But why wouldn't they listen? Because the Lord intended to kill them. They knew not the Lord. And when you go back to John's Gospel, I'm in John 16 on page 1085, there's another illustration of this point that the worst people are those that that might be religious and know a lot of things that are right, but they don't know God. And he's warned, he warns his disciples, I'm in John 16, these things have I spoken to you that you should not be offended. Don't let this put you off, this terrible thing that's coming. They'll put you out of the synagogues. Now the time is coming when whoever kills you will think that he's doing God's service. They know what God has said, but they don't know God. And these things will they do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. That's the terrible point about it. They don't know God. Now this man, going back to John 9, he's blind from birth. And I just say this to you, spiritually, everyone is blind from birth. We are born with a fallen nature, that's Adam's legacy to us. And consequently, we have no spiritual vision at all. We're blind. And you cannot see until you're born of God. Now, it's a very drastic and uncompromising statement, but it's very scriptural. You know the verses in John 3. Page 1066, and on verse 3, Jesus said to them, to him, Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. As much as he may wish to, as much as he may study, as much as he may resolve to do what is right, as much as he may go to the right church, as much as he may be a Bible student, Except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The importance of the new birth, regeneration. It can't be overstated, friends. Without it, there is nothing but unbelievable eternal disaster. Except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5. Truly, truly, I mean, when the Lord repeats that, there's an emphasis there, isn't there? Truly, truly... I say to accept a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now that being born of water, some discussion about that, which is absolutely unnecessary, it's so obvious. And um, I'm just picking it up from Titus. You'll know these scriptures, I guess, but I just want to make the point that it's absolutely spiritual. It's not about being baptised. He says this, that I'm in Titus 3, that's on page 1205. Uh, our verse 4, after the kindness and love of our Saviour, God our Saviour appeared toward man, 
Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration. That's the water that he's talking about. And renewing of the Holy Ghost. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. Nobody on this earth has ever earned the salvation of Jesus Christ. But by the washing of regeneration, being born again, a new birth and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, um, to say, this man is born blind, spiritually, everyone is born blind, until they are born again, regenerated, born of God. And, um, and it's just, you know, when you're a human being, you've got blood coursing through you, you've got your breath, you've got your mind, You've got those trillions of synaptic links that you can think and remember. and you know, A little smell will take you back ten years to something. You know, the, all of that is in you. It's a, life, it's a kind of life that is phenomenally complex and very real. It's just the same when you're born again. There's a new kind of life that comes right through you and in you. Something from God that, is, that only comes from Christ. And I'm just picking up and I'm coming to a conclusion on my Bible references, but I'm just picking this up again from the letter to the Corinthians, the first of Corinthians chapter 15, this, this great chapter on resurrection. And um, back in verse 45, the lovely long chapter, so incredible this chapter about resurrection, the world to come, and how certainly it is that if Jesus hadn't risen, we would still be in our sins. It, the resurrection is essential because it proves that that life poured out on the cross was sinless. It was a sacrifice that we can depend on because it was sinless. It gets us right with God. Nothing we can do will put us right with God but faith in what Jesus has done. But I'm reading and this distinction here in um, this great chapter on resurrection. I'm reading verse... Um, 45 it is written the first man Adam was made a living soul what a complex incredible being is a human being we've got a little baby in the family now and every time I look at him I think oh, goodness me you know, the, 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 the God who made him and the, the complexity you know, the way that he would just blink and he'll look and, you know, all of that. And then he obviously remembers, he'll smile, he'll touch. He's only six months old. And, you know, then there's trillions of cells. They've all been put together correctly. Everyone, everyone on like a little computer. And, uh, you know, he knows when he's hungry. He doesn't know how to speak yet. They're starting to say la la, you know, they, like they do. But he, he knows how to tell you because he cries because he needs some food. And, and then his tummy gets right. You know, the, the, and, that, and that heart that, started ticking that could go that could beat for a hundred years what a machine is that now, it's all of God it's God and the first man was like that but the last Adam Jesus Christ is a life giving spirit I know he's had a body too of course he has a body of course but he is a life giving he gives spiritual life Spiritual life. I'm reading it. I'm in um, 1 Corinthians um, 15, verse 45. It is written, The first man, Adam, was a living soul. The last Adam, a quickening, life-giving spirit. Howbeit not that which was first is spiritual, but that which is that's natural. Afterward, that which is spiritual. That's what we've got to have, isn't it? Everybody is born as a natural being, made in the image of God, complex, brilliant, all those aspects of, our, of, our, of our, what our Creator has done in making us. But that's anyway not in touch with God. It can't live for very long. It gets old. It commits sin. It is headed for the grave. It has no hope of salvation in itself unless it meets with the last Adam, who is a life-giving spirit. It's so powerful, friends. It's so important. 
Now, this, this, this experience, this man is, I'm going back to John 9, he's born blind, he can't see. And he gets his sight. And he can't argue with the religious people who don't know God. They've all studied the scripture. Well, he's never been, been able to read a scroll, even blind. He's never been able to read a scroll. I expect he's heard a few things at the synagogue. He can't argue with them. But he's got what they don't have. And what they need more than he does, perhaps. He's got a testimony of having met with Christ and having his eyes opened. And every Christian has exactly that. Exactly that. A lot of us may not know, especially when you're first in a Christian, you don't, you don't know the Bible. You, you, if, you, if you're a Christian, you will be hungry for the Bible. You will learn the Bible. It might take you a few years, but that's going to be your goal. But you know this. You were blind, and now you can see. You met with Jesus Christ. And um, how to get that experience? Well, that encounter that opens the eyes, that gives life. To, to get to where we really know God well, we, and, be, and really are born again. Well, it's very basic, isn't it? And um, coming to an end, uh, repent and believe in Jesus Christ, God's Son, and particularly and essentially in his atoning death. We've celebrated this morning where we've commemorated with great thanksgiving the death of Jesus Christ. That is where salvation comes from. A belief that God's Son died for me and has settled my debt with heaven and I'm now his. Thank you. So what he says is this. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Thank you.